Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Julie Mulvihill, and I'm the Executive Director of Humanities Kansas. Welcome to The Big Idea. Um, this is an online monthly program um, to highlight and feature fresh scholarship in the humanities, and you are in for a treat today. We do welcome your questions um, throughout today's uh, presentation. You can put those in the Q&A. You can have chats with one another in the chat box. Whichever you are more comfortable with, we will be watching for those throughout today's presentation. Now, each big idea, if you're not familiar with the process, begins with an essay that's written by our guest speaker to share their perspective on a particular topic for your attention. And our idea behind this is that these resources, the essay, today's conversation, the extra books or films that might be suggested, are all ways for you at home to spark a conversation, to spark a conversation with your family, with your friends, with your neighbors about this really interesting topic that you may have not ever thought about before. And so keep that in mind throughout today's conversation. And we'll put a link to um, our guest essay in the chat box for you to look at if you haven't had a chance to already. But to begin today's presentation, I'd like to introduce the host of The Big Idea, Dr. Valerie Mendoza, and she will introduce and interview our special guest. Dr. Mendoza is a Topeka native and received her PhD in history from the University of California, Berkeley. She works in the public humanities where her research focuses on the history of the Latinx community here in Kansas and the greater Midwest. Valerie has served as a consultant to Humanities Kansas, to the Kansas State Historical Society, the Kansas Creative Arts Industries Commission, and the National Folk Life Network. If you haven't worked with Valerie yet, you might soon because she really is in, immersed in the arts and literature and culture community of Kansas. Welcome, Valerie. I'll let you take it away. Thank you, Julie. Thank you so much, everyone, for spending your lunch hour with us. I am thrilled to present and introduce Sheena Hernandez. She is a professor of English at Garden City Community College with over a decade of teaching experience in developmental writing, composition, and, and uh, various literature courses. Her background includes language history and linguistics, grammar, um, various literature genres. Beyond teaching, Hernandez serves as English department coordinator, instructional coach in curriculum, and professional writing consultant at Jar Garden City Community College. Since coming to Garden City Community College, Hernandez has developed several courses, including ethnic minority literature, and she also serves as a Humanities Kansas talk discussion leader. So welcome, Sheena. Thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate yeah. the invitation. How are you today? I am good. I am good. So I really enjoyed your um, essay, The Harm of Identity as Commodity. And one of the things that um, really struck me is that you talk about being um, an anomaly as a woman of color, a unicorn, mm -hmm. you, you put it, who, who teaches English. So tell us how you came to love reading and books and how that led to your career as an English professor. Oh, gosh. Um, you're asking me to go back decades, decades, yeah. decades. Um, I don't remember not reading. I think when I was extremely small, my mom used to just, she tells the story of where she would just hold up a book because she thought I was looking at the pictures, but then she realized I was actually listening to the story. And so I think I was an early reader and I just read everything I could get my hands on. Um, once I discovered libraries in my elementary school and then the public library, it was my absolute favorite place to be. Um, even now I get a little verklempt when I get into a library situation. My boys don't like it when I find a books a million or a Barnes and Noble, I could spend hours in there. Um, the women in my family were readers too. I remember my grandmother just having a book every evening. Now, usually it was what I called lady books or those, you know, romance novels that were really popular. Um, but she always read. And then I had my aunts who would bring me books. They knew that I liked to read. So I would get books for Christmas. And I remember getting these big bags of books that my great aunt would find for me. So I always had something to read. 
I loved it. Um, once I got a little bit older and started taking reading classes in elementary school and, and high school, um, I just, that was my favorite class to teach. And I had amazing instructors. Uh, Kathy Patty really honed my love of English when I was in uh, high school. And then that kind of took me to college where I thought I was going to triple major. And then I realized very quickly that that was too much. So I had to choose between, oh, you're gonna hate me. Um, I had to choose between English and history. <laughs> so I, as much as I love history and I feel like they go hand in hand, I just really honed in and said, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick English. And that, that was my home. That's where I felt most at home, especially after I transferred to my alma mater. So I've just been around books and reading and, and a big book nerd my whole life. <laughs> Are there any books that um, from your childhood or college days that stand out to you? Well, it depends on the story. Um, I remember one of the first books that I actually got to buy for myself. It was Matilda by Roald Dahl. And I loved it. It was my first time going into a big bookstore. I think it was Books a Million, which, you know, was my jam. Um, in fact, every time I still go back there, I still look for it when I go back home. And my, it, it's one of my favorite places. Um, my mother put me on a book ration <laughs> because I, if I had a book in front of me, I would sit there and read it within like hours. And so she's like, one chapter a day. Yeah. Um, other books that left impressions on me are usually books that I was introduced to through having to read them for school or something like that. But um, oh, what was another one I remember from my elementary days? Secret Garden, I think, was one. Uh -huh. Just thought it was a beautiful book. Yeah. Um, the Ramona Quimby series. Oh, yes. Yes. Oh, my gosh. I love those. Um. So those types of things kind of stick with you over time. And, you know, I'd love to introduce them to my children, but of course they are anti doing anything for mom's work. Anything that seems like mom would make them do it. So, uh -huh, uh -huh. yeah, mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're book nerds in uh, my household too. And the library is uh, definitely a, a favorite place. We're very fortunate that um, here in Topeka, the public library has a hundred book limit. And we've, we've approached that at times. <laughs> so. I would remember going to, once I was old enough to go to the local library by myself, I would grab as many as my little arms could carry. And I would walk myself there and walk myself home. So it was just literally just carrying books. I loved it though. My favorite place. Yeah. It's so, a good thing things are imposed. <laughs> yes. So let's talk about what's considered the traditional English literature canon. Those, oh, everybody must read this book to be, you know, um, conversant in uh, literature. So what are some of those most taught books and what are some of your favorites? Oh my gosh. Um, well, the whole idea of the canon is just so interesting, isn't it? It's like picture this long list. I always pictured this um, stuffy room full of cigar and, you know, tobacco and, and all of those things. And these, these men sitting around going, this is literature. This is not literature. I don't know how far that is from the truth of how this went down. But we, we picture this list of the canon and there's the same names on it. Every time, every syllabus has something. Um, Shakespeare is always on it. Uh, Faulkner, you read, it's something that you read several times. Um, Fitzgerald, Joyce Hemingway is always on a list. Uh, Bronte Sisters, Austin, if you want to get fancy and throw in a few women, Tolstoy. Um, if you grew up in Alabama, Harper Lee was required reading. Everybody read that book. Um, but you'll notice a pattern with the canon, and it is very monochromatic and uh, gender specific in places. Um, now, there's been a little bit of wiggle room, right? Um, but it always felt like like it added after the fact. Like, look how diverse we are. Here are five 
writers of color, you know, mm -hmm. and that's not the teacher's fault. It's, it's what's in the anthology. It's what's available. It's what the course is. Um, so I'm not necessarily blaming anybody, but there are, well, the same names that show up on all the syllabi, right? Mm -hmm. We teach mm -hmm. what we know and what we've been taught. Um, yeah. As far as my favorites, which I think was the second part of the question, um, I love uh, mythologies, right? But a lot of the mythology that I grew up reading and I studied were um, uh, European ones, Greek and Roman, which I still love these stories to this day. But it wasn't until later that I was introduced probably in college to African mythologies, mm -hmm. right? Um, or anything that wasn't European. Um, another book that really sticks with me, I've been talking about this book, I swear, it feels like 20 years. Um, Erskine Caldwell's Tobacco Road. Have you read it? Uh-uh. No, it, it is the most horrific and wonderful book you'll ever read. Like it is, I don't even know if I su should suggest it, but I still love it. Um, it was introduced to me in a Southern Gothic lit class I think and I was just like I can't stop talking about this book all these years later mm -hmm. love it it's horrible it's wonderful um wide sargasso sea these mm -hmm. things kind of stick with me so I've had really good experiences and I've, I've gotten a lot out of these books but there aren't a lot that are not of a certain kind um I don't know if that's the right way to put that and then there are some that are um there's like a handful that are on the canon um, that are minority lit. Hurston is off and on. Um, let's see, um, Achebe is always on if we're looking for something um, in a world literature, but it's the same five names mm -hmm. in the anthology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not to take away from them either. Very important works. Very important works. But yeah. is that one of the reasons that you um like created the uh uh the the ethnic minority literature course? Honestly, it it was one of the reasons. Um and also for myself, you know, these are things that I'm like, they have to be out there. Right. Part of my job as an English instructor is to introduce my students to things and I want to introduce them to things that look like them. Mm -hmm. Things they can relate to or at least see something of themselves in. Right. And so that just wasn't something that we have already had here. So I, I thought there would be, I need to say it this way, a good market for it, but also I think part of me did it for selfish reasons uh -huh. also. Yeah. You know, it's like I would like to read and study literature that seems familiar or of a group that I'm not necessarily familiar with, but to see how this correlates with their experience also. Right. right. Well, and you're in the perfect spot. I mean, Garden City, I know that in the high school, they speak like tens of languages I mean I don't even know how many languages are spoken there so it's such a diverse oh it is a wonderfully diverse community it really is um and so it's interesting to me and I don't know necessarily what they study in the high schools but I can guarantee you one of those things is probably going to be Macbeth <laughs> right um and things that we decide or someone decided at some point it this is literature and we will put this up on this this pedestal here um but the thing about the canon is it doesn't shift very much or very quickly so mm -hmm. there are things yeah. that are left off yeah yeah well in your essay you talk about um literature's art and then i think you know, most of us can kind of understand or have an idea of, of what you mean by that. But then you also talk about literature as business. Mm -hmm. um, so tell us a little bit about that. And how does that hurt authors of color? Well, everything in capitalism is business, I think. It's all about consumption, right? 
So um, literature, as much as we like to put it on this pedestal and, you know, it's part of the greater conversation and it does all these things, and it is a type of art, it's still a type of art that's meant to be sold, right? Mm -hmm. And so publishing houses um, publish literature for profit. I mean, that's their bottom line. But at the same time, I think this makes them more mercenary in their decisions about who they back and who they don't. So they might be making business decisions based on limitations or how well they think something will sell or if there's a market for it. Mm -hmm. And if the market is primarily non or people, how do I want to say this? Um, European descent, then that's what's going to feed their bottom line, right? They're going to move in certain markets. And this kind of limits the talent that could be, I think, mm -hmm. um, especially in terms of writers of color. Um, because if you already have someone on your docket that is doing young adult lit and they happen to be black, do you want to invest in another one? And so that is kind of, I don't know if that was a clear explanation, Valerie. Was that? Yeah. No. You seeing what I'm talking about? It, yeah. It seems very cold, but I think in the bottom line is they want to move a product and they're going to back the people they think are the most sellable in right. terms of the work and personality. And well, and over the last few years as well, the the publishing community has gotten smaller and smaller as the bigger publishing houses take over the smaller ones. And, yes. you know, there are just like, I think, three or four really uh, groups that, you know, control the market, basically. So, yeah. Yeah. So um, let's talk about cultural appropriation, which you also mentioned in your essay, because this is a topic I've been thinking a lot about recently, both, you know, as an educator and as a, a, a public scholar. Um, one of the things you bring up in your essay is the controversy surrounding the book American Dirt by mm -hmm. Jean Cummins. This mm -hmm. book, um, when it came out, was selected by Oprah Winfrey as one of the books for her book club but it caused a huge amount of controversy refresh our memories it did like the week before it came out it was so much controversy not necessarily because of the topic but mostly because of the author's ethnicity she um is white she identifies as a white woman and so you have this white woman who is writing about you know violence in Mexico and having to immigrate illegally to escape that violence and it just seems not necessarily a mismatch but it really raised the question of whether she should be talking about these things that she has no um, familiarity with really. Um, she even brought up in her own author's note that she wished someone browner than her would have written the book. And I feel like that kind of negates the people who did write on these topics that mm -hmm. have experience with it or more familiarity or more authenticity towards it. Um, also, side note was coming. She got like a, I think it was seven figures mm -hmm. for an advance for the book. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, you have people who are not getting as much promotion who are writers of color, who are writers of, um, who have had genuine experiences um, like Zamora or Rhea or something coming from that place who aren't as well known, honestly, um, who aren't getting that sort of recognition. So it really just goes back to that question of who should engage with certain topics. Mm -hmm. But yeah. it also makes it kind of sticky, right? Literature's art, who are we to censor people for for writing art, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, 
So, so why are authenticity and voice important? Hmm. I think things, uh, now I'll go back to Rhea and Zamora and Cummins. I think what makes their books different from Cummins is lived experience or, or pulling from that place of experience. Um, as far as being authentic, for example, you know, I could write a book about being, you know, a character who's living the life of a gay man somewhere, but it's not really going to come to it from a place where I understand what that actually means. Mm -hmm. I think unless you write from some place of understanding that struggle or more familiarity with it, more than just the information that you get from news articles, you know, that have been cherry picked to get your attention or what have you, you really don't understand the experiences of, of certain people. And I think that can lead to um how do we want to say this? Misinformation about other people, other cultures. It it comes from a place of misunderstanding instead of leading to true empathy with those people. Um, so I think writing from something authentic makes the voice and the work stronger. Mm -hmm. If you write like you just researched something and that's all you know, it's going to sound like you researched it. Mm -hmm. I don't know if mm -hmm. you've read the book. Did you read the book by um, Cummins? I did not. And I think because of that exact reason, I remembered when it came out. I was like, yeah, no, I can read. Yeah, you're right. Uh, you can um... read. When I read the book, I was like, this sounds like a reporter wrote it. Like that someone looked it up or that it, it it didn't feel genuine. It didn't feel like a it was coming from a person who understood struggle or being ostracized to mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. Not to it. If you loved it, you loved it. Um, but when I read it, it sounded inauthentic. Yeah. Well, and as you were talking, a couple of books, you well, a couple of writings came mm -hmm. to mind. The first thing that came to mind that left a huge impression on me when I read it in college is Charlotte Perkins Gilman, The Yellow Wallpaper, right? Mm -hmm. And that is just, you know, reading that for the first time. So powerful to me. And, you know, she had experienced that, right? And the other one is, you know, The Invisible Man. And, right. uh, you know, how, how it felt to be a Black man in the 20th century, right? And, um, yeah. yeah, so it, it comes from a more powerful place, I think, um, when someone is writing from an experience they're more familiar with. Um, that's not to say that you can't have different characters in your books. Um, if you are a writer of color or a writer who identifies as, as white, it is perfectly okay, I think, to engage or create characters that don't necessarily look like you or think like you or what have you because otherwise you just have a very boring book but I think it's important that you engage respectfully mm -hmm. I think that's the difference between um a book feeling authentic and having that power behind it and also um not creating a caricature mm -hmm. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in recent years, you know, we've had organizations um, come up, a, a couple of that I know about, and I want to hear about some that you know. We need diverse books. Um, Latinos in publishing is another uh, group that I follow, just to to name two. What do you think about these types of organizations or others that advocate for underrepresented authors? And tell us about the hashtag publishing paid me that you mentioned in your essay, because I am not familiar with that. Um, well, I think it's great that they're there. I 
am dismayed that they have to be there, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, but if you don't start somewhere, if you don't have someone to push, then we'll just keep doing what we're doing, right? As far as publishing is concerned. I don't know too much about those particular groups, but I'm all for advocating more of a diversity and literature. And I think it's just so important that as you're growing up, um, you have something that you can refer to that kind of looks like you or reminds you of you or something like that. Um, as far as publishing paid me, this was very interesting. It started as a Twitter hashtag um, where an author just said, I was paid this amount of money for my advance for my book. And it was very low. I think it was somewhere around $10,000, which seems like a good amount of money to me, but I'm not writing. This isn't my livelihood. Um, like if somebody just gave me $10,000 for something I just wrote. Um, but in comparison, other authors, primarily white authors, uh, were getting six-figure deals, high six-figure deals for um, publishing. And it's the difference between someone who is who's won awards for their first book still having to fight for $50,000 advances, $100,000 advances, um, versus someone who just came in off the street that they think is sellable and getting a $400,000 advance. Um, so this kind of took off and hundreds of authors uh, of color and white authors um, just shared what they made. And this really brought a spotlight onto the discrepancies between the value that publishing houses place on writers of color versus um, other authors, which I think is pretty interesting. This isn't something that as a consumer I thought about because I thought all authors, once they got their books, just made millions of dollars. Um, yeah. But um, I think it's very interesting to see those discrepancies. I think it's pretty brave of those authors to share especially because if that's your livelihood, you are afraid of making enemies of your publishing houses um, or they may have NDAs in their, in their contracts or what have you. But until people know that these things are happening, they weren't really moved to change anything. Mm -hmm. And so um, shedding light on this really prompted them to do a bit of PR on the publishing house side to uh, show that they were addressing the situation and fixing it and I don't know how fast they're fixing it but it was something that I think needed to happen yeah and it seems like one of these things the things that these types of groups are fighting against is what um, Nigerian author Chimamanda Adichie discusses in her TED talk the danger of a single story and if you all haven't seen that we'll put the link in the chat for you it's a really great you know 20 minute um, TED Talk, but in it, she, and again, she's from Nigeria, but she recalls reading books um, when she's a youngster and they, they, they all took place on the English countryside. And people always discussed, you know, the weather. <laughs> and, um, and so when she started writing, that's what she started writing about, you know, the weather and, um, you know, eating apples and, um, and and things like that and and uh, you know about snow and that that you know as she grew older she realized this doesn't represent my reality or the reality of where I, I grew up and and started writing you know books and actually I opened a publishing house with one of her instructors um you know, because one of the things she says in her talk is that, you know, there's assumption by publishers in Africa that there is not a public for African stories, right? Just like you were talking about. It is such a strange thing. I love that TED Talk. She would talk about her characters drinking ginger beer. You know? mm -hmm. And at one time, I'm like, what is ginger beer? Is that like ginger ale? I'm like, I shouldn't have to Google this, but I did. <laughs> um, and so I... I I was just struck by that talk also because she talked about having to discover African books in Africa 
And I'm like, what on earth are they reading if not African stories? But that's the same experience I had growing up. I There weren't necessarily stories with young Black children in them unless they were, you know, in the 1800s or, or you know, something along those lines, working with that kind of adversity. Um, there were no books about, you know, young black children slaying dragons or, you know, something like that. It's, it's hard to see yourself in, in these situations or, you know, other situations or what have you, if you don't see yourself in the literature. Um, and so it's, um, I just, it still strikes me that she said she had to discover African literature. And then at the same time, I can't be too surprised, you know? I also had to discover a lot of it. Not that it wasn't shared with me in bits and pieces, but um, it's something that I had to go out and find, but there wasn't a lot of it. Um, she also talks about in that talk, the single story, right? The perspectives we get based through the literature uh, that we that we consume and the dangers of that. And I found that so interesting because she talked about, um, or I'm paraphrasing, literature being the human condition and we're conditioned through our literature to feel certain ways about people. And I think I, I mentioned this before, um, and she mentioned it definitely. At its worst, when we're conditioned, it leads to pitying people. She talked about that in her talk, um, or meeting people with anger because we believe that that is what we see. Um, if we only hear about people killing each other, right? In a certain area, that's what we're gonna expect. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're conditioned by what we consume to believe certain things about people instead of having true empathy for people based on realistic expectations and realistic portrayals, we have caricatures. Right, so. mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So one thing, um, just to pivot a little bit, one thing you bring up in your big idea is imposter syndrome. So you can, can you talk a little bit about what you mean by that and how can we help alleviate that, you know, for ourselves and the next generation? Oh, God. Have you met a teacher that doesn't have imposter syndrome? <laughs> I, um, I kind of feel like I have it twofold. I am... 100% convinced that I work with people who are 10 times more brilliant than I am. Um, so on that end, we've got that on the educational scale, right? Um, on the other end, where I am in Garden City Community College, I absolutely adore my colleagues, I do. But I kind of stick out like a sore thumb in the department photos, if you catch my drift. Um, so I kind of am feel a double unique here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and it's not anything that anybody's done here with my colleagues or anything like that, but it's the circumstances. You know, I grew up in small town in Alabama. Then you go off to college where you're convinced that everybody's 10 times smarter than you. And then you work with people that are obviously brilliant and you're the only one who kind of looks like you. It's kind of, makes you a unicorn to go back to what I said before. Um, as far as changing it, do you mean like, how do we encourage this change in society? Do we, how do we change it in education? One of the first things we have to do is let the kids read. We have to let the kids read. We have to encourage it. Um, schools have to be deliberate in their investments. I think um, some schools, I won't say all schools do this, but the ones that we've read about, the ones we've heard about where they're taking books out of the libraries and what have you, um, it's not gonna stop that kid from 
having questions about their identity or sexuality or gender if we get rid of all of the books that make us uncomfortable. We have to be willing to be uncomfortable a little bit and yeah. allow these children to discover themselves and just encourage them to read. Um, and then, especially children of color. I don't know that it's necessarily a cultural thing, but you know, we weren't, or at least as I was growing up, it wasn't really expected that, you know, we'd go, or I, I'd spend all my time in the library. Like that was weird that I like to read so much. Um, we also need to put some pressure on the publishing companies, I think. Also, they have to see there's a market for it. Um, I think as consumers, we just have to request these stories. We have to be open to stories that don't necessarily look like us in our experiences and buy them, read them, request more of them. There has to be a place for these characters to exist, especially in genres that they don't typically exist. Right. Well, tell us about some of the books on your to-be-read list. What should what should we be looking out for? It's November. I'm in the middle of grading. I have a <laughs> couple book mm -hmm. um, in a couple of weeks. I don't know that I have another list other than um, the ones that I suggested before. But, you know, I would encourage anybody who has read something and they're like, oh, you know what? This is one voice of the immigrant experience. Let me go see if I can find another, right? Somewhere in that collective, you will find something that will promote true empathy, I think, for for all, all people involved in the situation. Um, and ask yourselves questions. Is this a fair portrayal of what is going on or is this inauthentic? So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, if you haven't read it yet, I think Solito by Zamora, mm -hmm. that's, that's going on my list for sure. Um, I believe he was nine years old when he made the immigration journey by himself. And I have to absolutely read that. Mm -hmm. What about your list, Valerie? <laughs> um, yeah, you know, um, I can't. It's November. Yeah, I, I will. I will tell you a book. Um, you know, again, going back to the to immigration experience from Mexico that I, that I did read that that I would suggest to people is um, the distance between us by Reina Grande, and it talks about her immigration um, experience as a child, and, and and her experience was that her dad left first, and this is fairly common in the Mexican uh, Mexican mm -hmm. migration experience to come to the United States, and he was here for years and years um, while she and her siblings were, were back in Mexico being raised um, by their grandparents. But, um, so that's definitely one I would recommend. But we have a, um, a question for you. Um, Deborah asks, have you considered the, that exclusions and minoritizations are the reason that people are socialized to, you know, um, think of themselves like, uh, as uh, superior or inferior, um, you know, that that kind of thinking uh, as the dichotomy um, is something that people are navigating. I don't know if I caught that entire question. Could you, I think I missed the first part of it. Yeah, so she asked, have you considered that exclusions and minoritizations are the reasons um, that people are, are socialized to kind of think of themselves in, you know, in hierarchies? Hmm. I don't think she's wrong. I think it's a bit of a sticky wicket. Mm -hmm. So on one hand, Speaking of somebody who loves literature and all of these things, I think everybody should read everything. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if we don't actually, at least at the start, figure out some way of bringing these voices to the forefront forcefully, 
I don't think we're going to have very much change. We have to do it in such a way where eventually it does become the norm and we don't have these hierarchies and minoritizations. Um, but I don't think we're there yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Did I kind of get close to your question? Yeah. So we have another one from Tim, and he asks, um, if authors feel afraid to cross over culturally in their writing, will they not be limited to a kind of silo of the imagination? Will they, will they perhaps have less empathy and less ability to help readers appreciate the experience of the quote-unquote other? You know, that's a very good question, too. I don't think that you should limit yourself in the characters you create as a writer. I just think you have to engage with them in such a way where it doesn't feel like a stereotype. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think we may have to get some outside opinion on this um, whenever we write these characters, but it's, I'll grant you that it's a line. It's a line that's hard to know what side you're on at some times, mm -hmm. whether you're being respectful or whether you're creating or perpetuating more stereotype. But I think as a writer, that's something that we should be aware of when we when we create these experiences and what have you. I think mm -hmm. that there may be room for Cummins's book, but there should be equal room for other people's works also that are more mm -hmm. authentic and that maybe we should treat them with the same amount of respect mm -hmm. and the same, give them the same amount of promotion, but that's it's not the reality of publishing, unfortunately. Right, and well, I think for that too, part of that is that it was Oprah Winfrey, right? Mm -hmm. Who has such this big platform, but as a woman of color, you would, we hold her to a higher standard to promote other, yeah, people of color as, uh, as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so one last question is, um, I, I missed this at the at the beginning, and um, so uh, the uh, the question is, you use the term minority to describe identities, which I think is a colonial term to people who were minoritized in in the settling of the United States. Would you be interested in a term like historically excluded identities? Is that better at what we're trying to get at? Mm -hmm. Probably. I'm open to it. Um, it's not the term I used. And I, I can't tell you specifically why I didn't, but um, other than minority is recognized. But I think historically excluded is also a good way of describing the groups of people that I'm talking about. And it's not just racial, it's it's gender, it's sexuality, it's all of that. So that might encompass it. Great. Well, thank you, everyone. This has been a really great conversation. Julie, I'm going to hand it back over to you. Yeah, gosh, I'm still just, you know, jotting down some notes here from such an interesting conversation. And I guess the only thing I can add, Sheena, is that I'm just so grateful that you were raised in a family of female readers. And we're just so happy that you've carried that tradition on to your life and sharing it with your students and your broader family. So thank you for that. And thank you for being so open and honest with your um, answers and Valerie for your questions, which really, I think, helped pursue this really interesting and important conversation. So our thanks to both of you for that um, experience today. So we want to thank all of our guests who joined us today online for the big idea. We do take December off, but if you're a big idea groupie, you'll want to rejoin us in January. Our next program is scheduled for January 12th, and we'll be joined by Cheryl Brown Henderson, who is the founding president of the Brown Foundation for Educational Equity, and she'll be talking about Will We Overcome? Brown at 70. 
Um, 2024 is the 70th anniversary of the landmark Supreme Court decision, Brown v. Board of Education of Topeka. So Cheryl will be visiting with us about what that legacy means at the 70th anniversary. So put that on your schedule. And again, Sheena, thank you so much for today's conversation. And as always, thank you, Valerie, for such a terrific job in, in hosting this. Thank you.